When I kind of first started, I was asked to write this piece about, the, uh, it was part of a larger edited volume about the Arab Spring across the region, and they needed somebody to kind of give Palestine's take on it. And I just kind of thought, well, nothing's happening. What am I meant to write about? Like, there's absolutely nothing that I could possibly bring that's new to the table. Um, so I started looking kind of deeper into the issue, and it actually, you know, it, it's interesting because that in itself, the fact that there was no mass mobilization during a time of huge turbulence in the region was incredibly kind of revealing in the sense that, you know, Palestine has always been a forerunner in terms of popular mobilization in the Arab world, um, particularly, you know, with the first and second intifadas, which really did, um, was really kind of like an enlightening moment for a lot of Arab nations during those two, two um, instances. But yet, here you are, you know, one of, one of the biggest kind of mobilization movements and that's kind of sweeping the region and suddenly Palestine is just quiet, even though you would think that out of all of the countries they'd have the biggest cause to, to, to you know, start getting into the streets and then, you know, get moving. Um, you know, so it actually then kind of led me to sort of start looking at things that, you know, what are the kind of mechanisms that suppress resistance? You know, what is it that's stopping people from getting up and, and you know, getting mad and getting into the streets? And it's actually, you know, it wasn't the issue that there wasn't discontent. It was the fact that Palestine, unlike, you know, most other countries, was kind of sandwiched between, almost, you know, sandwiched between a military occupation and an oppressive, you know, internal authority. So it was really about looking at mechanisms of control and I, you know, surprisingly didn't realize it at the time, but my work was already on security sector reform, which is a process of building up security sectors in places where they don't exist and it's an international state building project. And one of the biggest impediments at that time to any kind of mobilization efforts that were happening um, was the Palestinian security sector. And so it led me to kind of delve deeper into the subject. and. I then realized that actually international state building processes are instrumental in terms of determining the level of mass mobilization that you can have in any given state, um, particularly in contexts where they're involved. And in many cases, it's precisely you know, part of the agenda, which is to stop um, indigenous mobilization in these contexts. And so it becomes very much part and parcel of the projects themselves, which then lead these projects to become projects, you know, not of um, this kind of politically benign state building that we would think of it as being, but instead, you know, instead of the emancipating discourse that we're given, it instead becomes this kind of oppressive population control and surveillance project. And that's precisely what you see in the, in the, in the Palestinian case and particularly in the Palestinian case, which is incredibly revealing, um, although not the exception at all. The Palestinian Authority was essentially created as a re kind of political response to a political problem at the time, which was the first Intifada, which was the first huge, you know, popular mobilization um, that the region had seen, you know, in, in, in the late 80s. And so you had this creation of a Palestinian authority and with it came the creation of a Palestinian security force. It was part and parcel. And in fact, the, the, the legitimate mandate of, uh, or at least the international mandate for the Palestinian authority to exist um, for both the Israelis and the international community is precisely that it needs to ensure that there is a strong security coordination amongst the Palestinian security forces and the Israelis to clamp down on anything that is anti-status quo, anti-Oslo, um, anti-Israeli. So the security forces have been you know, the pillar of the Palestinian Authority, essentially, and it's, subsequent, like, it's subsequently grown in, in terms of its size and power precisely for that reason, not only because they need it, you know, not only because Israel and the international community see it as relevant, but also the Palestinian Authority itself, which sees it as relevant in terms of maintaining its, you know, control and hold over its position, considering now that it's, it's increasingly becoming or increasingly facing a legitimacy crisis amongst its own people, the security forces now more than ever are constantly called upon to suppress any kind of like protests, 
um, you know, potential organ underground organization, whatever it is, the security forces have become essentially the pillar, um, not only in terms of being used as a coercive arm, but also in terms of being used as a, as a force of co-optation, because it's also one of the biggest um, providers for jobs and, 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 and you know, um, financial security for a lot of Palestinians, because it's one of the few avenues they have to access you know, work, especially considering the majority are uneducated and, and come from obviously poor backgrounds. Absolutely, um, it, it's not even indirectly, it's actually directly. Um, mostly because within the Oslo Accords, one, their mandate to exist depends on them cooperating with Israel, um, you know, handing over intelligence, ensuring that they do joint arrest, or whatever it is that Israel needs, they are there at hand to, to provide that. The, the Western states, if you look at SSR projects across the board, they tend to be implemented in places where you've, you know, they've had former colonies, essentially. So arguably it can be seen as, as a kind of modern Western um, extension or continuation of colonialism, just guised as another kind of, through its emancipating discourse as a state-building project. But absolutely, I mean, again, you know, Western projects, depending on where their interests lie at the time or in the context of intervention, you have different outcomes produced from, from um, security assistance and security sector reform projects. You know, so in some contexts where, you know, where their interests warrant it, they'll, you'll have a more militarized security sector, and in other contexts you'll have a more de demilitarized security sector. Like in the Palestinian case, they don't need an army, they just need a policing force to police indigenous you know, um, uh, populations, so they've created just that, a policing force. Uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, they needed something to, um, you know, they needed a counterinsurgency force. So anything that would threaten or, or jeopardize American presence in the country, and that's precisely what they created, a counterinsurgency force in these places. So again, where, where interests lie is what you end up you know, having created. To be honest, I don't see a substantial um, or any difference in terms of Hamas's position from what we had a, a kind of month ago or a few weeks ago, sorry, um, to, to what we've seen since their inception um, as a de facto government in Gaza. Um, you know, just the fact that Hamas were willing to participate within elections and to, to begin with and then try to form their own government and were met with a massive um, international and also, uh, I use the term loosely here, local resistance, but that coming from the local authority, not the actual people themselves. Um, you know, that, the fact that they were willing to participate within the system itself is kind of very revealing and very telling of the fact that they are able to transform their politics. Um, and they're able to do it in a way where they don't lose a sense of themselves, but they're willing to adapt to existing circumstances. And even then, when they were willing to try and kind of make some leeway through the system and try and go through the legit legitimate processes, um, they were met with an international embargo and then, you know, a subsequent siege and, and you know, three wars that followed. Um, so, in terms of their current position now, honestly, it's no different to what they've been practicing over the last, you know, decade. The only difference is that you have it more in writing, it's just more concrete. And even then, um, even now with the, the incredible concessions that they're willing to offer, uh, the same thing, you have the same uh, you know, cycle go around, which is Israel's claiming that you know, it's just a hoax and there's still a terrorist organization and then you have the Americans refusing to acknowledge um, their legitimacy as well in the international community. So, um, absolutely, I mean, absolutely, I don't, I don't see a significant difference in terms of practice from either parties. Um, and what's more is that you know, Hamas is, uh, and it's important to recognize this, but Hamas's objection to, to the Palestinian Authority and, and the state building project going on in Palestine has nothing to do with religious dogma, but it's more to do with the fact that the existing you know, projects and the existing state um, of, of interventions in the occupied territories, if we're talking about kind of aid and development being offered, their resistance to that or their objection to that has nothing to do with the fact that they're this kind of, you know, um, you know, a, a terrorist organization that, you know, just refuses to acknowledge Israel or whatever, um, or the, any of the kind of essentialist debates that are coming out of that, but more has to do with the fact that it just doesn't resonate with the needs of the reality that they face. You know, how can we start building these institutions when we're still under an occupation? We don't have the freedom of movement. We can't even determine our own, you know, citizenship, for instance. If, we, if, if you want new passports created or if you want, you know, uh, 
to, to register someone as a citizen, that all goes through Israel. They have no control over their land, their, their borders, their airspace, their sea, <laughs> nothing. So it's more to do with the fact, simply the fact that they are a very pragmatic organization and they've learned from the mistakes of the Palestinian Authority, which is, you know, by cooperating with Israel, you're simply perpetuating the reality that we find ourselves under, which is incredibly unpopular with a lot of Palestinians. And for that, the Palestinian Authority and the Fatah party that governs it have really lost a sense of themselves. They're an incredibly divided um, organization and institution. I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't see this administration being any different to, to previous, especially if, if you're talking about benefits for the Palestinians. I mean, when during Trump's visit, he didn't really talk much about, if at all, Palestinian self-determination, but yet he commended their security sector about three times. <laughs> So, I mean, that in itself is quite telling and just simply the fact that, again, they refuse to acknowledge the legitimacy of, of Hamas completely. Um, but also, you know, what you're seeing with Trump is, is more the fact that he's kind of also calling out Abbas, you know, President Abbas a lot more, um, which isn't really doing the Palestinians any favor because you've now seen, you know, harsher kind of restrictions and, and a harsher clampdown for, you know, just so Abbas can prove the fact that he's, you know, has power and he's got, you know, the ability to, to, to control the territories. So in terms of really altering the, the existing reality for Palestinians, at least for the better, I don't think this current administration is going to be the one to do that. <laughs>